Good evening. Welcome to our program once again. We are the Friends of Solidarity Monthly Magazine. Tonight we have as our guests two of the co-founders of the Committee in the Support of Solidarity located in New York as our guests. We'll be discussing further issues on the solidarity movement in Poland and we'll diversify a bit and talk about the solidarity's role within uh, the Western world. I'd like to introduce them once again. On my far right is Dr. Jakub Karpinski. He is a professor now at the State University of, of New York at Albany. He has written the uh, book Countdown, which is a modern Polish history dealing with the crises of Poland in several years, ending with in August 1980, which we'll discuss a little bit later on in the program. He is the author of several other books on modern Polish history and was a leader in uh, st demonstrations in Poland in 1968, and as a result of these activities, was imprisoned for several years after that. He was the uh, professor of sociology at the Warsaw University when he was in Poland. Our other guest, Irena Lasota, is uh, teaching now at the Fordham University in New York. She is also a reporter in, uh, for Radio Free Europe, lectures on solidarity throughout the country, and uh, discusses solidarity activities has done several TV appearances, uh, especially after the imposition of martial law in Poland, is a co-editor of the Solidarity Bulletin, and has uh, did special editing on the Solidarity issue of the World Affairs magazine. We know that the uh, Pope will be uh, coming to Poland on June 17th to the 22nd, I believe, and that's going to have a major impact on that because he's made several demands of the uh, Polish junta. Of course, if nothing prevents his visit, because it's very possible that in the very last moment the government will say, well, we don't like the Pope in Poland because the security in the country is uh, not sufficiently guarded. So uh, I would uh, consider the visit of the Pope as still uncertain. Is it possible that uh, you know the, the Polish uh, country of Poland being so devoutly Catholic, and the Pope, uh, the government is obviously trying to uh, to take some advantage uh, from this uh, visit because they would like to uh, treat the visit of the Pope as at least a part uh, legitimization of the martial law regime in Poland. Of course, the attitude of the population is quite different. They welcome the Pope in Poland very much. He was, he was born in Poland, but as uh, the Pope, he visited Poland in 1979, and it had a tremendous effect. And even according to some interpretations, it was one of the causes of the creation of Solidarity Movement, because when the Pope came to Poland, people started to feel this feeling of solidarity, which gave the name of the movement. Mm -hmm. This is a good point to discuss, perhaps, the, um, the role of, of the, well, the Pope and the Church. The solidarity itself is the Union, the party, and then the uh, military regime. And how do all these actors seem to, to play with each other? But most specifically, I'm concerned about how the church relates with the solidarity movement. Yes, let's start maybe from the church. The church is the only independent institution legally existing now in Poland. Of course, there are other independent institutions like solidarity, but they are underground. The church is legally recognized. Of course, it's not a matter of goodwill from the part of the government. The government and the party considered uh, uh, it uh, ob obligatory in a way. They feel to be compelled to recognize the tremendous authority and tremendous influence of the church, and they don't want to provoke the Poles by any uh, legal or illegal action against the church. As I am saying, they don't want it in general, but there are some instances when they at least try, at least try to test the uh, reaction of the church. There were 
instances of uh, beating of some uh, activists uh, in one of the Warsaw churches quite recently in April. There were cases of priests being imprisoned. There's also a lot of uh, uh, attempts to discredit the church, either through gossip, through propaganda, uh, for example, the uh, government. But it's always, not only in the last years, but in the 35 years, uh, they were trying to bag the houses of bishops and they were trying to spread. Uh, they even were at one point running underground papers pretending that they are the uh, dissidents within the Catholic Church. So the police is active, they want to prevent the church from having an influence, but they are not successful. Maybe what is worth of being mentioning is the fact that the demands formulated by the church coincide with the demands of solidarity and formulated by solidarity leader Lech Wałęsa. They all demand amnesty, amnesty at the first place, the amnesty for political prisoners. They also demand that the people who were fired from their work be reinstituted and that all the legal rights were uh, imposed uh, on them. And also among the uh, common demands of Solidarity Church and Awensa, uh, one should mention the demand of changes in the trade union law, changes which would uh, at least a bit uh, allow for some possibilities of the pluralism in the uh, labor uh, movement. You mentioned that the trade union law, that this is the new trade unions that the military junta is trying to um, be as the, the only Poles. union representative, representation in Poland. I think if I remember uh, in some of my readings was that uh, you only need a membership of like uh, a few dozen people and you've already set up a new chapter of this union. Of and course, and it is uh, very carefully s uh, watched uh, who it tries to establish this new unions and in the practice only the people who uh, have the confidence of the party are allowed mm -hmm. to do it and there is no uh, legal possibility of any contact between the different uh, government sponsored unions established in the factories. They have to be so completely isolated. Mm -hmm. yes. It's a typical effort. I think it uh, can be treated as a summary of how the communist authorities would like to uh, have the society look the like. They want to isolate everybody, even their own uh, sponsored by themselves uh, unions or so-called unions. Yeah, I think it's it's important to point out too that you know the, the social resistance movement uh, as part of Solidarity's program uh, to 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 fight these unions. And one incident I recall was that they tried to sign up a lot of people at the factory, and they started singing the you know, Polish national anthem and turned around and walked out. Maybe some other uh, instances you could relate uh, on the way the social resistance, the fabric of that resistance, is propagated in Poland. In Poland, it is co called a front of refusal, which means the refusal of taking part in the government-sponsored activities, and in particular in this new uh, government-backed unions. Uh, there were people very successful in such efforts in the refusal to sponsor the government in Poland, and I have in mind here the actors who refuse to uh, play to be on the screens of the government TV. But one have to add that the government was also very successful, not in uh, making people appear on TV, but they simply dissolved a union. 
um, so it was an act of the guild, as not mm -hmm. even a union, it was dissolved. Then the painters and the sculptor refused to cooperate with the authorities. The authorities simply dissolved them. And uh, then we go to the old saying by the German uh, dramaturg Bertolt Brecht about uh, leaders of a country, which they were so annoyed by the country that they decided to dissolve the country itself and elect a new population. So maybe it's finally what is going to happen in Poland. We hope so. Uh, the amnesty demands of the Pope, we can return to that for a moment, is to uh, release the people that are in prison at this point. We had the internment camps, uh, we had the penal camps, and we've got people now in prison on jail, st jail terms and that. We have specifically the seven solidarity leaders that spent a year in prison camps and then were immediately arrested and are supposed to be going on trial for uh, as traitors to the country and, and this for anti-governmental activities yes uh, as <laughs> it is uh, formulated by the official press and when the pope arrives he's going to he's i think he's made clear that he's going to present those amnesty demands oh yes yeah. how how do you think the government's going to react with that when you have the millions of people that are going to be coming to see the pope uh, the official spokesman of the government was interviewed by the, was, was asked by the foreign uh, journalists whether the Pope's speeches will be c controlled by the government in Poland, and the answer was that it is a normal practice that during the state visit and the Pope is a head of state, that during such a visit there is some form of mutual agreement or cooperation and people uh, from the other government let uh, the hosts uh, know what they want to speak about, but, and it's important, the spokesman said, that it does not concern strictly uh, religious activities. Mm -hmm. So I think the Pope will be quite free to say what he was always saying, namely to demand full amnesty for the people imprisoned. And it would have a tremendous effect uh, in Poland. What impact do either of you see the, the Solidarity Union having on uh, the Communist parties out in the West, for example? I mean, uh, the Communist parties in the West are very unfortunate, one has to say, from the beginning, from the moment uh, the Communist uh, was built in the Soviet Union, the real victims of it have been the Communist parties in the West, who have to answer, unless they are totally isolated, like the U.S. Communist Party, which nobody even asks them any question, but. <laughs> Communist parties in France and in Italy had to ask a question, how come communist means misery, death, why whenever communism goes, uh, uh, everything turns wrong, how come people are workers are always revolting against a communist state. And uh, for many parties for which uh, the Soviet invasion of Hungary, Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia, Cambodia was not an end yet, like the French Communist Party, solidarity was almost the last blow. Mm, solidarity was very well known in France, it uh, aroused a lot of sympathy. And then the Communist Party of France, for example, of course, had to, or chose to defend the policy of Jaruzelski. So they are uh, same, it's a strong party, but ideologically, again, solidarity was a blow, at least for those who were not convinced before. Yes, the, the, from the very beginning that it is a real working people movement that everybody who belongs to so-called working class belongs to solidarity. That the Communist Party in Poland, it's a party of white collars, of uh, people who work in the offices and to whoever is uh, a worker belongs to solidarity. This is clear class-like division in Poland make visible to everybody who uh, did not uh, know yet that uh, it's a country in which the working class is totally in the opposition against the communist government. 
It's hard to defend uh, in any rational way uh, a philosophy and an ideology that is supposed to be for the working class, and the working class has to go and start a revolt. <laughs> it's a bit difficult to explain. So if we diverse to the, to the West a bit, I wonder if we could uh, explain to our viewers um, the kind of the network of solidarity that is outside of Poland. Uh, not solidarity as a union itself, but the supporters of solidarity. Um, yes, yeah, it's very important. As you said, solidarity mm -hmm. is only in Poland. Outside of uh, Poland, there are many different supporters of solidarity, and one can find them everywhere among governments. There are governments supporting solidarity, there are Polish groups supporting solidarity, there are American, French, Italian, Swedish groups uh, supporting solidarity, and very often they work together. There is a very strong support for solidarity among the uh, free trade unions in the world and also in the federation of the free trade union, like the ICFTU in Brussels. There is support for Poland even in the United Nations. One should be surprised because mm -hmm. United Nations for the last few years were rather a uh, body which was supporting mostly Soviet initiatives or uh, very often or always third world initiatives. And the case of Poland was so blatant that even the Human Rights Commission of the United Nations, which, uh, for in which it was very difficult to pass any resolution condemning the Soviet Union, passed very strong uh, condemnation of what happened in Poland and passed it twice, in 82 and in 83. One could also mention in this context the International Labour Organization, which uh, acts under this uh, aegis of the United Nations and uh, this organization, aware of the role of union freedoms, uh, defended solidarity from the very beginning. Solidarity leader Lech Wałęsa was uh, uh, making a speech uh, at the meeting of International Labour Organization and he impressed, I think, even uh, some uh, official delegates from the communist countries. The FFL-CIO in, uh, in, in the United States has been a very big supporter of solidarity. And Even one can say it supported solidarity before solidarity existed. The first, uh, not only resolution supported, supporting solidarity, but the first $50,000 from the, the AFL-CIO a fund were given to Solidarity, which didn't have that name yet, in the beginning of September 1980. And it's not surprising, the FLCIO did have a long history of supporting uh, free trade unions uh, in the communist countries, or rather, one has to say, of saying that the existing trade unions in communist countries are not free. The FSCIO never do not recognized represent people uh, whom, whom people. they were yes. supposed to represent. And they simply, the FSCIO would not even discuss any matter with any representatives of uh, so called free, uh, so called trade unions from communist countries. So when the workers revolted in 1980 in Poland and there were the strikes, uh, the FSCIO was both a support in the leadership of the union, but also a very strong grassroots uh, support. And here one can look mm. for different sources. Let's say if one knows the history of the uh, CIO, the Council of in uh, Industrial Organization, it was created mostly by uh, workers of Polish origin in the turn of the century in Chicago, Detroit. But also there is something else. The FSCIO was always um, very good in the educational aspect of its activities. It had been informing the American public, the American workers, about the labor camps in the Soviet Union, in the fortress when the Soviet Union was a very popular ally of the uh, United States. The AFSCIO was pressing in Congress a special legislation which would forbid the importation of slave labor into the United States, mostly not to buy a wood which was cut by the prisoners in the Soviet Union. So the FSCIO, for example, not only sent uh, through the ICFTU uh, printing International material, Confederation of Free, free Trade <laughs> Unions <laughs> in <laughs> Europe, <laughs> uh, not only they sent help to Poland uh, as requested by Solidarity, but the mm -hmm. Solidarity leader Lech Wałęsa was invited to come to the uh, 100th anniversary convention. He never made it. And uh, after the state of war, of course, again, one could see very strong support. And uh, I think that in times of unemployment, 
and big hardships of the workers in the United States, it's even more remarkable. One thing we could still mention on the, the network of, of solidarity support in the West is that it's based on the same lines of looseness and, and small groups as the solidarity movement itself is. Certainly is that correct? so, yes. There is an amount of coordination, there is an exchange of information, of course, as in the, in the solidarity itself, but uh, these are groups acting for their own people who decided that solidarity is their cause that mm. they are for the struggle of the Poles, uh, for the trade union laws, for more freedom, independence. And there are different ways of helping solidarity. What can do it either through the direct aid to the union by sending money, printing equipment. One can do what many unions and many individuals in the United States did is by adopting families of prisoners and sending them relief letters. One can do it by informing public opinion, by uh, lobbying the congressmen, senators, uh, the State Department, by gathering information, distributing information. So it turned out that uh, December 13, the, when the state of war was uh, imposed in Poland in 1981, was a moment with, when a lot of imagination of people was created, where people spontaneously all around the world, and uh, you know, it's not only the United States, in Australia there are very strong support groups, but Japan has also one of the strongest uh, group for supporting solidarity, one of the strongest in the industrial world. We had a, uh, in the Polish Hall, we had a display for solidarity and uh, we had some of the uh, Japanese solidarity bulletins and most people were quite fascinated with those. In our, perhaps we can go back to Poland itself again now and um, Dr. Karpinski's book, uh, Countdown, which explains modern Polish history and, and the upheavals that have taken place since uh, the Second World War. And if you look at the dates, uh, 56 to 68, to 70, to 76, to 80. I mean, the time periods between upheavals is getting much, much shorter. Mm -hmm. And we hope that we can have one more in two years, and then we won't have to have any in another four years. <laughs> Would you yes, care to comment? There is a, a circularity in the post-war Polish history in the sense that uh, events repeat itself, but they repeat itself only to a certain extent. There is also a process of education. People are gaining something. And what happened in 1980, mm. I think, is irreversible. There is no way out. There is no hope for the government to educate people in the way in which they would like to have people educated. Namely, there is no way of uh, um, assuring subordination, of uh, developing this uh, Soviet type of personality, obedient people ready to fulfill any orders from the government. It's no more possible uh, solidarity uh, made uh, for everybody clear that there are some ways of uh, making improvements even the, in the communist ruled so society there are there were possibilities of legal action of such strong movement as uh, solidarity was in 1980-1981 and solidarity was pressing the government all the time and the government felt uh, it uh, obligatory, felt itself compelled to make concessions. It is meaningful, it will not be forgotten by uh, Suppose. But what is then the meaning of December 13, of this imposition of the state of war? I think it uh, makes even more clear the divisions existing in Poland, the fact that uh, struggle should uh, be continued, that uh, the other part is uh, decisively for uh, 
forbidding people to organize is decisively for forbidding people to exchange information. They are for the communist ideal of society, meaning uh, the uh, organization of people subordinated to the authorities. And the real meaning of solidarity is that people uh, are able to organize, that people are able to resist the tremendous pressure exercised by the government, by the party. But one can ask, what is the hope for a country which is surrounded from three sides by communist countries and on the north by a sea? I think uh, the achievements of solidarity, the possibility of organizing parallel structures, parallel education, parallel exchange of information, all of that has been done and is still being done in the communist country. Some people were saying that in the communist country there is no room for history, there is no room for any change. And the history of solidarity, the history of post-war Poland shows clearly that there is a room that a lot can be achieved. Solidarity is here to stay and it's going to continue. How about uh, Jaroszowski and Junta? Oh, they also are going to continue. They have a clear program of suppressing the opposition. The state of war introduced in Poland in December 1981 was a clear demonstration of of their aims. Uh, the struggle is going on. They would like to deprive this society of any means of opposition, of any independence. And they make everybody aware of these aims. They're having the control, they're trying to suppress the people, that, that's the goal, correct. But then that should, in, in Moscow's views, that should be basically done through the party and not through the military, though, isn't that right? By any means, I would say. By any means. Yes. <laughs> and the, here is but a the weak point. Solidarity rather seems to be <coughs> to stay forever. It exists in people's consciousness and it's a widespread phenomenon. And here are people who are serving Moscow and the master can one day replace them by mm -hmm. somebody else, and uh, they have to prove, but I think, by all means. Yeah. It, it's important, and say, say, to say we've, again, such a uh, short time, we've run out of time, pretty much. But I want to stress again, the Committee in Support of Solidarity in New York is main aim is to express to the American public uh, the opinions of, of, of Solidarity's uh, Temporary Coordinating Commission and to present to us constantly in the public eye the views of solidarity and keep that in mind. Our role here in, in Seattle, a small one, is in the same vein, to constantly keep these matters before the public attention. And uh, that, I think, too, is in parallel to what the aims of solidarity are, too, and the social awareness of Poland and its upheavals. And we have to make the American public socially aware of, of the importance and the impact of what in history is probably has never happened before that you have a communist state with an independent trade union functioning for a short amount of time. And the suspense is not over yet. Yes, what is not. going to happen next? We have to keep alert and keep a watch. We want to thank our guests from New York and their time, and thank you for watching.